Um, so hi everybody, tell us who you are, um, what job you do, hopefully it's something to do with social work or working with people, tell us what you do, what university you're at, tell us what year you're in, um, tell us what you've had for your tea and get yourself comfortable. Um, we have done a little sneak preview today which is just a secret between us and the people watching and the thousands on YouTube. Um, so if you didn't watch it live, you missed out on that. So hopefully you will watch the next one live. Um, we have lots of people who have uh, come to the webinar for the first time. Welcome. We've got lots of people who've been to every single webinar. That is fantastic. And we've got lots of people who, um, this is the second webinar, it seems. So it's good to see that even though this is our 16th webinar, people are still joining in. We're getting new people all the time and people are telling other people um, about these webinars. Um, so that is fantastic. Just to say the number of people in the room, um, just because we agreed we wouldn't do that, but I don't know how many people have registered. So I think Omar and Siobhan, if you could have a look at the number and see are we about <coughs> birds. We can get yeah. going. Yeah, we're almost I think, we're getting close. I think we should start. We'll just say we're not going to say numbers tonight because our guest speakers are not wanting to know the numbers tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> joking, joking. <laughs> so you are honestly in for a real treat tonight. Um, I, I've, uh, we've got two guest speakers with us tonight. Two absolutely fabulous guest speakers. <laughs> We've got Aunt Lewis, who I invited tonight because I heard Aunt speak. I'll tell you about it later, but I heard Aunt speak and um, it stayed with me as the best conference presentation that I have ever heard. So tonight you are in for a big treat. But we've, uh, we may need to be, we may need to adapt slightly <laughs> in terms of when we come to the presentation, but you'll see why later. So um, Ant will be um, our second special guest tonight, speaking towards the end of tonight's webinar. And we've got Vicky Walton-Cole, who has been attending the webinars. I've not met Vicky before this evening, but I've seen her slides. So I know you are in for a real treat when um, Vicky takes the practitioner spotlight later on this evening. So those of you who've been to, and I know we have some people who have been to every single webinar and tonight is number 16. Um, those of you who are here for the first time, you are very welcome. But our webinars look at social work theory and practice, but we are also bringing in voices of experience as well. So tonight we're going to look at the models of disability, the theory, the practice and the experience. And I think it's a really important topic that we're doing tonight. It's also very timely as a topic. Some of you may have seen the, um, I don't even know how to put it really, the word finding is, I'm struggling with, but the furore around Amazon and the t-shirt sale that was on sale on Amazon. I'm not gonna show you a photograph of that because it's so highly offensive. But the row about the t-shirt, which was being sold on Amazon, which was basically um, hate towards people with disabilities, reminded me of the use of t-shirts in social work. So the, uh, the image, the poster of World Social Work Day 2014 was all about t-shirts hanging on a washing line. And we're gonna return to t-shirts if you like, we're going to sandwich tonight's webinar with t-shirts. T-shirts at the beginning and there'll be a t-shirt at the end of tonight. So instead of showing you the picture of the horribly offensive t-shirt that was on sale on Amazon and has had disability rights movement um, campaigning about taking that off sale, instead of that I'm going to show you this t-shirt which Becky brought to my attention. So if you follow Becky on Twitter, or if indeed if you follow Social Work Student Connect on Twitter, you'll perhaps see uh, the third level as an employment training and um, organisation for people with disabilities. And this t-shirt, All Humans for Hope, to me is a much nicer t-shirt image. And all humans should be working together for hope. The final t-shirt image that we're going to start off with is this. To remember that as we talk about models of disability tonight, we need to remember that not all disabilities are visible. 
and so we're going to be talking about disability generally we're going to be exploring the theory the models if you like of all disability both uh, visible and invisible disabilities so the t-shirt row on amazon made this week a very timely topic although our topics are decided quite a few weeks in advance it was very timely this week but the other thing that's happened this week that makes tonight very timely is that we started these webinars because of the coronavirus pandemic and the fact that people were being becoming disconnected from their learning during the pandemic and this week these statistics came out from the national the Office of National Statistics, the report came out that illustrated that statistically evidences beyond all doubt, 59% of all deaths involving COVID-19 in England and Wales between March and July of this year were of disabled people. 59% of the deaths of COVID. So mortality rates between people who are disabled, people who are not disabled, 2.4 times higher for women and two times higher for men. If you have attended every webinar, you may remember that we talked about death making in webinar three, which was in June. We talked about the concept of the way in which people who are devalued by society are more likely to have their lives shortened because of the inequality that they face. And this is death making at its very worst. What you will hear a lot from governments at the moment is uh, people, it's, it's people who have underlying health conditions. It terrifies me that phrase because it's used almost as a way of saying, so it's not such a bad thing. It's terrifying. So we really need to think about the way in which society is devaluing people with disabilities. And so tonight is a really important topic for everybody. In social work, as you will know, those of you who are qualified social workers will know that we, and social work students too, will know that we often use the word theory as a coverall for a range of different concepts, theories, models, methods, approaches. Last week we were introduced to a paradigm, you know, a whole new way of looking at theory. So we touched on this in the first webinar that we did. Uh, which was about the theory fear factor and we're going to revisit it in next week's webinar which is all about returning to the basics of theory and practice because we know that there's a lot of new people joining the profession we wanted to go back to basics but just to remind you this image demonstrates that a model is about the way in which we intervene. We're gonna revisit all of this, what's a perspective, what's a theory, what's a method. We're gonna revisit all of that next week. But just to highlight for you, a model is about what we actually do. So models of disability are about what we actually do in our practice, or even more widely, what we do in our lives. So there are methods that come out of models tonight we're going to be looking at models of disability that means we're going to be looking at the how we do what we do how we actually deliver things so it's more than a theory a theory is how we understand a model is about what we actually do <clears throat> and how we intervene in a given situation and so tonight we're going to be looking at models there are two main models of disability the models that everybody knows about everybody talks about the medical model and the social model and we will be exploring those but we're also going to explore another model of disability the tragedy model of disability we will be considering that along with two other models that are often used in disability services but can also be used more widely the charity model and the gift model. So all together, we're going to be looking at five models of practice, five models of disability. And we're gonna be talking about the models, but then we're gonna bring in some practice from a practitioner spotlight with Vicky and some experience from Ant's presentation later. So we're going to be looking at the models, but as alongside of that, the theory, the practice, the experience. So let's start with the medical model. Let's start with that one. Here's an illustration of the medical model. What you'll notice here 
is all the arrows point inwards. The arrows are pointing inwards because in the medical model, the medical model perceives the problem to be with the individual. The problem is the condition. The problem is the impairment. And the medical model sees the impairment as intrinsically bad, a negative thing. It looks for cure for this terrible thing that has happened, this impairment. Disability is seen as being caused by the condition or by the impairment. There is a major focus on what is perceived to be normal. And the expertise in the medical model lies within the professional hierarchy. That's how a medical model looks. A medical model is all about pathologizing, if you like, or blaming the individual with the condition. It's down to them. Any problems they face, well, that's down to them. That's down to the impairment. That's down to the condition. So a medical model, the arrows are all pointing inwards on that diagram. The opposite in many ways of the medical model, the medical model's been around for years. I mean, the medical model's been developing since, you know, the 19th century. It's been, medical model's been around for many, many years. Medicine has a very long history. You know, the medical model, is, it's been around for years. You can see the medical model on a daily basis almost. I was talking to a student that I was working with not long ago. Well, it was, uh, it was pre pandemic practice so I was working with her before the pandemic she was working with adults with learning disabilities and she was talking to me about um, some men that she was working with who were going to bounce therapy that was the thing they're going to bounce therapy this afternoon it's trampolining but it becomes referred to as a therapy because the person is the impairment everything becomes therapy if you have a disability, why can't you, you know, why isn't it just called amateur dramatics? Why is it called drama therapy? Why are we calling things art therapy? Therapy means that tr intrinsically there is something about the individual. We don't need to call things bounce therapy. Let's just call it trampolining. Let's be clear. Let's not pathologize individuals. That's what the medical model does. Medical model focuses in on what is the diagnosis, how do we cure it, or how do we treat it? That's the focus of the medical model. The social model, on the other hand, if you look at this diagram, you'll notice the arrows are all moving outwards. And that's because the social model, which is newer than the medical model, much more recent, it's from the 1970s, the social model perceives the issue, the difficulty to be society and the barriers that society creates. That's what causes the disability. It's not the impairment, it's how society responds that creates the disability. So we understand the social model understands labeling creates disability, stereotyping creates disability, attitudes create disability. Inaccessible environments, and that means both in terms of buildings, in terms of language, in terms of communication. Professionals who have routinized practice, we have to do it this way because it's the way we've always done it. That creates disability. Organizations that have inflexible procedures creates disability. Invisibilization, which is basically the process of the way in which people become invisible. Who are our positive role models? Where is disability seen and visible and pride? You know, pride, disability pride, where is all of that? People with disability tend to be segregated, tend to become invisibilized within society. And that's an example of a disabling society. So the social model sees the issues as outward. Society creates the disability. Social model is about looking outside of the individual, which is why the arrows are in the opposite direction. So often the social model and the medical model are seen as directly opposing each other. They're seen as the opposite to each other. So if we just summarise them, give a quick overview. 
The medical model, as I said, has been developing since the 1800s. It has a very long history. It's very, very well established. The social model, on the other hand, is very new. It was developed in the 1970s. The medical model locates problems with the individual. The social model locates problems with society. In the medical model, the person and their illness is the problem. So that's the disability is the person and their illness, whereas the social model sees disability as stemming not from the impairment, but from society and structures. In the medical model, the problem, the illness, needs to be fixed or cured, whereas the social model recognises that the concept of normal is misleading and unhelpful. And in the medical model, the expertise lies with the medical profession and its inherent hierarchy. And in the medical profession, the hierarchy is very clear and very well laid out. Whereas the social model, expertise lies with the individual. So what we've got here is two totally opposing models. And if you're more of a visual thinker, you might just want to remember it as the medical model, the arrows are all coming in, the pressure the build-up, the pressure, the stigma is all on the individual. The social model, the pressure, the change is on society. The arrows are coming outwards. So now you might think, and this is the, just to let Vicky know, this is the final slide before we go on to Vicky's practitioner spotlight. But you might think, you know, I know that social workers will say, well, I use the social model. I'm a social worker. I use the social model. Obviously, health professionals use the medical model. It's not just because you're a social worker that you use the social model and a, and a medical model is a medical professional. It doesn't mean just because you're a social worker, you're using the social model. If I'm honest with you, a lot of social workers are drawn towards or pressured into the medical model sometimes because of the procedures that we have to follow sometimes because you have to make sure that people meet criteria for service delivery and that can push you towards a medical model sometimes assessments from social workers to me sound more like a medical assessment it's all about what's the diagnosis what's the treatment what's the it's all that focus rather than looking at the change that's required in society or the change that's required in the systems and structures that support people. So what I want to say to you is, as a social worker, let's not kid ourselves. Let's, let's not think, oh, we use the social model. And I do think that there are some social workers that I've come across who just see it in a very simplistic, social workers use the social model, medics use the medical model in a very simplistic way. And it just doesn't work like that. So let's not kid ourselves. Let's be honest. Let's be clear that sometimes in practice, maybe we don't like it, but maybe we've been pushed into a medical model. Because if we can be clear about that, we can begin to challenge the systems and the structures that push us into that. But let's not pretend. Let's have some level of honesty as practitioners. So that's the social and medical model. Very uh, quick introduction. What we're going to do now is we're going to hear from Vicky, who is this evening in our practitioner spotlight. So are you able to talk? Are you on microphone, Vicky? Can you take yes. over at this point? Oh, I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. Um, hello, I'm Vicky. Um, through my slides, before I introduce myself, there's a number of photos. Um, all of them are... are some sort of accessibility fail. So if you want to try and pick out what it is, uh, go for it. Um, can you push the next button, please? Um, so a little bit about me. I'm not an expert on disability. I'm not even an expert on my own disability, uh, at my own diagnosis, but I am definitely an expert on my own disability. Um, I have a number of diagnoses which um, have included fibromyalgia, hypermobility spectrum disorder, degenerative disc disease, uh, functional neurological disorder and because of that I am a, what's known as an ambulatory or a part-time wheelchair user. So a lot of my discussion will be around the physical aspects of disability. Um, 
like many disabled people, I use identity first language. So uh, I put here, I'm disabled, I'm queer, and I'm a white woman. Um, a lot of universities and uh, places of learning are still teaching person first language, which would say it's a person with a disability, it's a person with autism. Um, and that is rejected by a lot of people in the disabled community because that reflects the medical model. Um, so we like to say, I am a disabled person. I wouldn't say I'm a person with queerness. I'm a person with whiteness. So just make sure you're asking people what their language preference is. Um, and then what I'm going to do is take you on a little bit of, journey, of my journey through um, disability and link to um, being a social worker. I've been a social worker for three years now and I practice an adoption team. Next slide, please. Take me seriously. There is a lot of research um, about women not being believed by medics, um, specifically when it comes to pain. And this is even worse when it um, comes to people of colour and women of colour who are even less believed. And you can go away and you can look up that research. Um, it's really quite easy to find. Um, women who report pain and any sort of physical symptoms are far more likely to be sensed by a doctor or a GP to psychology or psychiatry um, or given antidepressants rather than investigations and diagnoses um, or, or investigation for diagnosis which white men seem to be able to get a lot easier. Um, it was only within the last 20 to 25 years that medical research has routinely included women um, so this is quite a significant amount of time when we've just been excluded from this. Um, my own experience is that I first reported problems that has now disabled me to the GP in my very late teens and early 20s. Um, so my joints can uh, partially dislocate very easily and I was reporting this to the doctors and being told, don't be so silly, that's not possible. Um, why don't you go and speak to a psychiatrist? There's obviously something wrong with your brain. So when it comes to the people we work with, it's really important to believe people. If they're reporting um, issues to you, if they're reporting that they're living in pain, they're living in fatigue, they've got symptoms, it's so important that we believe them um, because they could be facing a similar response from doctors. Doctors are amazing, doctors have lots of knowledge, but doctors don't know every single disease. They don't know the rare diagnoses and they may not be taking some of our service users seriously. So if you believe them, that's possibly gonna really help. Um, I'm gonna move on now to don't judge a disability by its name or its visibility. Um, Omar is going to help me very much here. Um, so by looking at me and listening to me, where would you put my current pain level? And hopefully there's a, a poll popped up um, and it's, uh, it starts with no pain whatsoever. Um, number two, splinter level, um, a sprained ankle maybe, or multiple broken bones um, or even beyond. But if you could just sort of have a think and and make a guess, that would be, I'll give you a couple of seconds. Um, and on this slide, just to say, this is one of the newer inclusive um, symbols because um, the, there is um, 20 to 25% of adults who are 16 to 64 in the UK with a disability. However, only around seven to 10% of those use a wheelchair and the sign that we have the disability on accessible toilets and accessible parking is always a wheelchair. And I think this model, this picture at least shows us um, a little bit of uh, what that could be 
uh, how that could be different and how it could be a visual reminder to us that not not every disability is someone sitting in a wheelchair okay um just gonna close that um so how how are we going with the poll oh i can't hear you siobhan I was on silent. Uh, can you see the poll, Vicky, or do you want me to tell you the answer? Yeah. Okay, so what we've got then is um, in terms of the people who voted, I won't say the numbers so that people don't know how. Uh, so we've got 19% of people feel that you have no pain at the moment. 20% of people believe you've got splinter level pain, 40% believe sprained ankle level pain, and 22% believe multiple broken bones pain levels on the polling. Excellent. Thank you so much for humouring me in that. Um, I will tell you that what I do, I, I sit between uh, just above the sprained ankle level and multiple broken bones all the time. I, in the last three to four years, I have never had a moment without pain. So well done to all the people that guessed the higher ones because they were far more correct. Even though I'm smiling and happy, uh, I'm still in pain. So that was my don't judge a disability by its visibility. Um, the first diagnosis I received when I um, became disabled just over two years ago um, to the point that I was hardly able to move, was fibromyalgia. Um, and that's something that we will work with a lot of service users with. Um, what I have found is that there is a lot of judgment over this name. Um, a lot of people are very quick to write it off as something that's maybe not so real or... Um, you know, people are, are faking and that, and that comes from um, mod, sort of the uh, so, social press and, and things like that. Um, it's very, very real. However, for me, I knew that there was other things wrong with my body. I knew that this wasn't the be all and end all. It's only through self advocacy with medical professionals that I managed to get any other. Um, investigations or diagnoses at all um, and I think there's a lot of lack of medical care and judgments for people with fibromyalgia and it's very easy for them to never get um, people with fibromyalgia to never get a full investigation afterwards so it's really important that we empower service users ourselves our colleagues to self-advocate with medical professionals um, right, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, sadly, this, um, this photo of me happened after a disability hate incident I received. Um, I'll just put it there to highlight that we are very open to receiving hate and discrimination on a daily basis. Um, so the right to work is actually a fight to work. So for me, I, I had a very, very long fight to return to work with a disability. Um, it's around, it's only around half of disabled people um, or less than half of disabled people that are actually in employment. And um, for the rest of the population, it's over 80%, I think, approximately, the current figures are for um, non-disabled people in um, employment. Employers do judge. We have the Equality Act, but when faced with someone who could need reasonable adjustments and someone that doesn't, um, it, it, you could face a, a lot of issues trying to gain work. Um, Equally, access to work and benefits don't always help. Um, so just when we're working with people to really remember that it may not be that they don't want to work. It may be that no one wants to employ them. Um, it, we know that it takes approximately 60% more applications from a disabled person to secure a job than a non-disabled person. 
So these are things to bear in mind and also another reason why there's a massive link to poverty and disability and it's around 50% uh, or more of people in poverty uh, have a disability or have a disabled family member. Um, oh, gone too far. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so views within social work, um, in, in my, with my employer, there's less than 3% uh, disabled members of staff. The um, reaction to my disability from social work managers was that I would no longer be able to uh, be a social worker because I was disabled. Um, when, I, when I managed to get them to reconsider, the, I then wrote to Social Work England and said, just updating you, I have a disability in case you need to know for qualities data. And they responded with, here's how you refer yourself to fitness to practice, which I was um, quite taken aback at. I'm like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm fit to practice. I just can't walk very well. Um, so that was really interesting to see. When um, I got Kelly to help me recently to look at research in social work, um, we are very much seeing disabled people are service users. The research is as disabled people, as service users. We are not part of the profession. We are not included in research on social workers. Um, they, I found two pieces of research in the last 20 years which look at access to social work courses. One, only one of them focus, I think one of them focused on disability or neither of them focused on disability as part of equality. So. The fact is that we are not seen as being able to be part of the profession. Um, if there's any academics out there, I really want to research this, drop me a line, quick plug. Um, I'm just gonna add that the views from society are heavily reflected in offices by managers, by colleagues, um, both about service users when it comes to disability and about staff um, and so for me that's that's a lot of views of benefit scroungers fakers which is things that have come out in the last 10 years so to me are we actually practicing as an anti-oppressive profession um, we should definitely be calling these things out in the office um, completely so yeah um, in work, uh, so the views of disabled people, I just said, um, we've, we've been highlighted as scroungers. Um, we are either completely unable to work um, or, or faking our disability, or we, we are this, this elite athlete that, you know, does these amazing things like the Paralympics we don't get a reflection of ordinary disabled people. I use the word ordinary as, you know, regular everyday disabled people going to work, being in the professions. It's just not reflected. Where, where do we see ourselves? Um, there's definitely a glass ceiling. Um, when I look at the equalities data at my work, it is not normalized to see disabled people in positions of leadership, positions of authority, um, it's 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 just not there. So you know the, the the there is a massive disability pay gap, and for us to see that we can get further, that would you know we're not there yet. Um, there's definitely a de deficit model to getting access needs and support. I have to tell people all the time what I can't do what is wrong with me um and, and it's never it's never about you know actually you know this is what's right but it's always what is wrong so the social model makes society accountable for access rather than myself um if you've ever just gone out for a day and thought oh yes we'll go here we'll go here we'll go there it, if i was to do that i would have to find out about each spot, about 10, 20 different things that you wouldn't even have th thought of. I'd have to find out about the toilets, about the parking, about ramps, about all sorts of 
you know, what the lights are like, you know, all sorts of things that people just don't see on a day to day basis. Um, so for us as social workers, it's, it's about uh, making access normal, um, reflecting that by asking people rather than expecting disabled people to always tell you everything that they need, ask them about it. Um, and just to, to remind everyone that the social model of disability is really the most accepted by disabled people because of its empowerment. So what now? Start to make yourself aware. There's a lovely photo on the screen at the moment of um, many accessible toilets have the family or baby changing facilities in them. Many parents don't realise that leaving the baby change down means that number one, a wheelchair can't get in there. Number two, uh, 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 someone who is blind, they're, if they're using a, um, a cane, for example, a white cane, then that's not going to pick up something at that level. So that's really actually very dangerous to disabled people to leave that there. Start to make yourself aware of um, disabilities. Imagine if you couldn't manage a step while you were out, what would you be able to get into the building you're working at or the building you're going to? Um, remember that sensory overload at offices and the buildings that we work in is a massive issue. Some people who have autism or neurological disorders have um, a lot of issue with uh, noise or, or, or sight vision issues and our offices are not a good place for people to be there. Think about it, think what could help. If you're coming into a CP conference and you're overwhelmed by the building, you're gonna be in a state by the time you even get into the building. Um, communicate to new service, them, service users and ask them what works for you. Do you prefer text? Do you prefer email? Do you prefer a, a call? Because that could be a really big difference. You might have someone who's anxious and doesn't like to answer the telephone. Um, don't don't um, criticise them for not answering a telephone if you haven't checked whether they're comfortable to do so. Um, learning about disability from disabled people is so important. Um, I'm gonna send out some people to follow. Follow people on social media who have disabilities. Read what we write, read what we say. Uh, watch, watch TED Talks like um, Stella Young, who did a, a most amazing one. I'm not your inspiration, thank you very much. Just see, see some of the battles that we, we face every single day, the barriers that are there and, and learn about that. Help us research um, into social work education and practice, um, include disabled people, um, go out with someone who is disabled, see the world from their eyes, help me uh, help me uh, fight Social Work England to think that just because I let them know I'm disabled doesn't mean I'm unfit to practice. Thank you, uh, Becky. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Very passionate presentation there and I think we learnt a lot from it. I was really enjoying, as you said, looking at the photos, what's the, what's the access issue. So thank you so much for that very powerful presentation and I know that you'll go into the chat now and chat with people, I'm sure and answer possibly some of their questions. So thank you for sharing with us the practitioner perspective there it was really helpful. Um, I know that there's uh, probably quite a few questions and I think Kat's probably got a couple for me, but I think I'm just gonna do a, a one or two more slides and then uh, see if there's any questions, Kat, whilst we're then swapping over for Ant's presentation, if that's okay. So um, Vicky, I think, has very powerfully demonstrated for us what the social model is and what the medical model is. But there's a couple of other models and some of it came through in what Vicky was saying. I think one model that I want to talk to you about tonight is the tragedy model of disability. And it's very often not seen separately from the medical model. Um, but actually, Michael Oliver, who is, uh, I think, one of the best writers still about disability and social work, um, he kind of brought out the idea of the tragedy model. So describing what's seen as sometimes the personal tragedy of disability. In this model, 
Having a disability is seen as a personal tragedy. The number of social workers I hear who will talk about, oh, it's such a tragedy what's happened, oh, it's such a shame. They're really illustrating the tragedy model in what they're saying. It's reinforced through language, as many of the models of disability are reinforced through language. It's reinforced through the use of language like suffering from or suffers with, or, you know, to talk of somebody suffering with a condition that, they have a condition, they don't necessarily suffer from the condition. And that's then you putting in your interpretation. The disability in the tragedy model is seen as resulting from the impairment, which is seen as blighting the person's life. This is a terrible, dreadful thing that has happened to them. Seeing the disability as a tragedy means that disability is seen as something to be avoided or eradicated because it's such a tragic, terrible thing. So we have to avoid this. And that's led to practices which have been referred to as death making, as we talked about earlier. So the late abortion of uh, fetuses that have a disability, which is allowed and an increased focus on the legalization of euthanasia, those kinds of things can occur coming out of the tragedy model and being clear about that and the lack of rights, human rights based practice that we need to see in disability is important. And the fourth one, the fourth model, again, linked into the medical model. But I see this a lot now in social work and it's increasingly concerning me, the use of the charity model in social work, where this is really all about the way in which services are provided by charity. It's all about charity and charity is just the word charity. So many charities that provide services for people with disabilities or for disabled people are based on a specific diagnosis. And so the charity model is closely linked into the medical model because it's all about do you meet the criteria for this? When services are provided within the charity model, then only the very bare minimum is provided. You know, this is after all charity. People are giving for, you know, the good of, uh, the out of the goodness of their hearts. It's all very much seen as the, per, the disabled person is this object of pity, this object of charity. Think about things like Children in Need and Comic Relief and some of the big television programs that really, and the adverts that are used that are all about pulling on heartstrings. It's linked into the tragedy model, linked into the medical model. Where care or support is provided through a charity, the individual is expected to just be grateful for what they receive and they're seen as having no right to complain because this is being given out of the goodness of people's hearts. Charities use processes like stereotyping and labelling in order to persuade people to give. Charities make decisions about who deserves help and who is undeserving of support, and that's based on labelling or categorisation. And some charities have now become so large in terms of their delivery, they're no longer what we might consider a charity to be, a non-governmental organisation to be. Many charities are now so led by government and meeting government targets that actually thinking about things like institutionalization, managerialism is really important when you think about the charity model. Um, this week, there's a book, um, we'll send out this again in resources. It's about learning disabilities specifically, but Sarah Ryan has written a, uh, I mean, Sarah Ryan's writing is always fabulous, but she's written a, a new book about um, learning disabilities, love and pockets of brilliance. Um, and she will talk a lot. She talks a lot about the problems with charity provision. And don't forget, as social workers, you're often asked to write to charities to get support for people. You're often asked to, oh, you know, try this charity, they might fund it, it give out food bank tokens. It's, we're very linked into the charity model. And the reason I'm trying to raise all of these models with you is so that we don't start just getting into a denial process of, I'm a social worker, I use the social model. Well, actually there's bits of the charity model in what you're doing, there's bits of the tragedy model in the way in which you approach things. So think about all of these models in practice. And the final model that I'm going to talk about is the gift model. Now, this isn't a model of disability, but this is a model of service provision. And it's a model of provision where care is done to people or given to people as a gift. So we're doing this for you. It's all about doing it for it, it links in all of these models linked together. It links to the medical model. It links to the charity model. But care is provided for you as a gift. When it's a gift, you've got no rights to say, I don't like this gift. I want to give it back. I don't want to, I want a different gift because that's seen as 
oh, you are very difficult, you're very challenging, you're very non-compliant, all of those kinds of things, because you should be grateful for the gift. Social work has to challenge all of this kind of thing. We have to challenge this, the gift model. Social work should be all about not doing things to people or giving things to people. It should be all about with, working with people. And I think one of the best role models in terms of thinking about disability in social work is Michael Oliver, who um, died last year. Michael Oliver, uh, although the social model was developed by the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, which was a, a union which set up, it was actually Michael Oliver's book in 1983, Social Work with Disabled People that brought it into mainstream focus and that brought what Vicky referred to earlier as identity-based language, very much the politics of disablement was all about that. Uh, so he wrote then that seminal text in 1990, The Politics of Disablement. He was very fiercely critical of what he described, and it links into the charity model, what he described as disability corporatism. And he said that in social work specifically, disability corporatism had replaced activism since the 1990s and very highly critical of us as a profession, even though he was a social work academic. Um, and I do think it's worth revisiting his work if you haven't read it recently, even though it's, you know, potentially it's old work, it's very worth revisiting. And so I see Michael Oliver as a major role model in terms of my understanding of disability. Another major role model is Dave Lupton, who is also known as Crippin the cartoonist. Um, and these are some of his cartoons which illustrate the tragedy model, the disability model, illustrate what Vicky was saying about how people are seen as being some kind of superhero or inspirational or there's no there's no ordinariness to disability. It's all about, you know, either being angelic or being devil-like or being hero-like. And these are some, I think, some of his cartoons that are fabulous. Um, he's done, um, there's, you can go, if you go to Disability Arts Online, you can see his um, cartoons over the last 30 years and they show the change in attitudes towards disability in a very visual way, in a humorous way. So I'd suggest taking a look at that. There's another resource for you that will direct you to. So there are two role models of mine in terms of thinking about disability and the way in which I look at disability. But we're now gonna to come to um, Ant, who is um, another of my role models. Ant is here with us tonight. And uh, I'm really excited that Ant's here. I first met Ant on World Social Work Day 2019, which is actually, ironically, the last time I was able to celebrate World Social Work Day because of course for World Social Work Day this year, we were in lockdown. So it's the last time I was able to celebrate uh, World Social Work Day and I was um, at an event uh, in the Channel Islands on Guernsey, it was, wasn't it Ant, that we met? And um, I listened to Ant's presentation. In fact, I, I did a little bit of, um, pressing an odd button or two i think for you Anthony. yeah yeah well done <laughs> thank you and um those of you who came to the shame webinar and uh, i shared my story when you hear ant's story you'll know why um it has a real meaning for me and uh, and i feel like a real connection with ant's story and um so we we've tested this out we're not quite sure how it's going to work <laughs> we've had to adapt tonight yeah. So we're going to do something very different. We've never done it before. Those of you who've been to webinars know we try, we try out different things all of the time. So we're going to see how this goes. So Ant might want to say hello before hello. we go into the presentation. I'm going to stop screen sharing and Omar will screen share, I think, in a moment. So we're going to test it all out, Ant. I'm going to... Hopefully. Hopefully. Is that working okay? Yeah. I can yeah yeah everyone can see that okay so i'm going to play it from now and you're spotlighted so everyone should be able to see yourself yeah. thank you very much for listening to me it is an honor to be here i am ant lewis i have had aphasia since 2007 when i had a stroke i was playing football heading the ball i hit another player in the head resulted in headache the next day, a blood clot in the brain. Before, I was assistant editor of the Jersey Evening Post. 
communication was my life. Then, it was gone. It has been a hard journey but bit by bit progress. Aphasia means no speech, no writing, I am language impaired. More than 350,000 people in the UK have aphasia, a disorder of language and communication. While stroke isn't the only cause of aphasia, it's by far the biggest. Around a third of people who have a stroke will experience aphasia. It can affect a person's ability to understand, speak, read, write and use numbers. However, it doesn't affect a person's intelligence. As part of my aphasia, I need time to process questions. The condition has not changed my values, what I stand for, or my ability to make a difference. Eleven years ago, it would have been impossible to effectively communicate but modern technology has given me, and others like me, a voice, and I want to use that voice to make a positive change for all islanders. Writing is difficult. I had to learn to write with my left hand. But technology has helped a lot. My iPad helps me to communicate and I can now read using a special camera attached to glasses. Thank you Ian. Fortunately technology has developed in ways that make it easier for someone like me to play a full part in the workplace. iPads with speech software, scanning glasses that make it easier to read long documents have all helped me. One of the biggest challenges for people affected by aphasia is that many people don't know enough about it or how they can help. Perhaps a little bit about me will help. My typical day. 7 a.m. Bathroom. My right leg, I have a bit of movement. My right arm, no real movement. Shower. I have to sit down. Shaving and washing my teeth, I had to learn everything with my left arm. Dressing myself. It is difficult. Stairs. Right leg, it is hard. Painful. No, but hard work. My walking has improved little by little but it is still difficult. My own older son Joe. Eleven year old. I make him breakfast. Weetabix, strawberries and a smoothie. He talks while I make his pack lunch. Me, I only have to talk a little, which is nothing to do with my aphasia. I drive Joe to La Rochia school. Yes, I can drive. I have an adapted automatic car and we are supported by driving for the disabled. An amazing charity. Later, I take Joe to football, cricket, hockey, or more. I have another son, William, who is six years old. Joe, William and first playing footy. I also have a 25-year-old son called Reese. I am a grandpa, too. I know what you are thinking, he's too young for that. You are very kind. Finally, dinner. Chicken stir-fry. Right arm, no, but it is easier these days. Joe's homework, it is difficult to help with my aphasia. Sometimes I'm not sure if I could answer regardless of my stroke. But it is a good excuse. I bring a new perspective, one formed by both success and hardship. I have fought to give disabled islanders a voice. I might be different but difference is exactly what I believe the Channel Islands want. I believe mental health provision must be higher up the political agenda. More understanding and reduced stigma. Where you see inequality and stigma, it should be fought. We are improving and have more cosmopolitan living. The dangers of having an island of haves and have not. The different communities. Everyone has skills and talents. Everyone. 
I believe that the most marginalized and downtrodden members of our society have something to contribute. For the inmate in prison to the homeless man, we have insights and abilities to help make the world a better place to live. An assistant professor of social work at Pacific University, Professor John Talabriza May, said, We rely on the strength of human relationships to survive and thrive. We are born into the world vulnerable, weak, and in need of physical and emotional nurturing. Immediately, we reach out to secure our first relationships. These original attachments are key to shaping a lifetime of connections to others. The strength of the original human relationship provides a path into the future, manifest helping to define what is possible. Brilliant. It is important. A system that allows those talents to flourish. The first step is to break down our own inbuilt stigmas. That is a role of education and defining common goals. To children, yes. More education about issues in schools. Not branded politics, but debates about how we want our community to work together. Jersey Youth Service, Guernsey Youth Service, an important part of play. We need to address apathy and lack of trust. Listen. Equality, we need civil rights. We need no racism. We need less old boys club. We are improving cosmopolitan living. To create a more equal island. The dangers of having an island of haves and have not. We need more social enterprises. To businesses and programs that build on our social link. Stronger. We also need greater recognition of support. The voluntary sector, with more effort, to coordinate the work that charities do. It is important. In the day, I am busy. I have joined lots of charitable committees. The Stroke Association, the Disability Partnership, the Daisy Trust, which runs the Daisy Cottage Retreat and Campsite in St. Juan, Driving for the Disabled, Enable Jersey Committee and Beresford Street Kitchen Committee. Beresford Street Kitchen is a social enterprise providing training and employment for people with learning disabilities and autism. Brilliant! May 2018 stood for the states as senator. I missed out on being elected by 300 votes. I was not disappointed. It was a great experience. Friendship at the hustings and a strong team of supporters. I hope I raised the profile of the disabled and since then I have been approached by a number of organizations who have asked for my help. February 2019 Jersey Street Hellier Three Quarters District. Deputy Richard Rondell has died. He was diagnosed with stage 4 bowel cancer. Deputy Rondell was an excellent parish deputy. Encouraged by the results of that island-wide voting in last year's general election, I tried again at the by-election in St. Helier last month. I came third out of ten candidates for a deputy seat. It was disappointing but I have to remember that only a few years ago it would have been unthinkable for a disabled candidate to come so close to success or to be taken so seriously. That is progress and shows how social and political attitudes are changing. Since my stroke, I have fought to give disabled islanders a voice. I walked the Jersey Marathon, and then ran half of it two years later. In 2012, 112 islanders, which is the number of people who have a stroke in Jersey each year, joined me on a cycle ride from London to Paris. We raised more than £150,000 for the Stroke Association and Driving for the Disabled. Guernsey Bike looking for an adventure.
Want to set yourself a challenge whilst raising money for our amazing charity? We have the answer for you. Why not join us on a fabulous adventure cycling from London to Amsterdam in September 2019? We will be travelling through four countries, England, France, Belgium and Holland, travelling 350 miles through some amazing countryside and historic towns. Four countries, 350 miles, two wheels. Me, trike. It is hard. Yes. Funny. Yes. Before my stroke, I helped to organize Jersey side by side, where 5,000 people stood on the beach to show their support for the victims of the 2004 tsunami. Now I want disabled and non-disabled being side by side in Jersey, working together, socializing together and playing sport together. In September 2018, Jersey Disability Discrimination Law is positive but it is the start of a journey. With a magic wand, I'd end the discrimination and stigma around disability, gender issues, mental health, sexuality, age and race. This is a cause that needs political leadership which is why I stood for the states. Changing perceptions is difficult and there are no easy answers but attitudes are changing. Many young people especially see disability as normal. I want everyone, disabled and able-bodied, treated the same and I am proud to play my small part. Britain's Got Talent winner Lee Ridley, a comedian with cerebral palsy well done. Like me, he uses a voice synthesizer to speak. What a great guy. He was brilliant and an inspiration to everyone. Innovative stuff. Lee has been in Jersey, December speaking at the Able to Work conference run by the Jersey Employment Trust. Lee is unable to speak and he won the 2018 series with his stand-up comedy routine as Lost Voice Guy. Lee was interviewed by a journalist who experienced difficulties with speech himself after a stroke. They both used technology to make their conversation happen. Video, ITV. Bit by bit, it is progress. Change will happen slowly, but we cannot get frustrated. We must be positive. I have a lot to live for because I am learning every day. I have just started archery and have lots of challenges on my to-do list. Video Archery The disabled bring a new perspective to everyday life, one formed by both success and hardship. We often see things in a different way, and that can be good for business. For me, life is not all about work, work, work. It's about taking every opportunity and seeing positives everywhere. Me. August's work. Government of Jersey, customer and local services in the capacity of disability inclusion officer. Exclamation mark. Exciting, nervous and happy. Please see disability not as a cost but as an opportunity. We all have something to give and this new law is a small step in helping everyone realize their potential. Thank you for listening. Thank you Ant for sharing that. Um, I know we had to, um, we had to adapt so that wasn't your usual voice was it? So to me it no. sounded really strange. I don't know if it sounded very strange to you. No, no. No. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, so much. We're going to um, make sure that we send the link out to people so that you can, so that people can watch the video that Ant talked about when he interviewed Lost Voice Guy. It's a really, it's a really lovely video. It's a really great yeah. video. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's time. Um, in terms of tonight. So we'll make sure people get to watch it. 
for Ant, I'm going to show your archery video now. Is that okay? Yeah, if I yeah. Show the archery video. Yeah. So, um, ooh, we've just swapped over screen share and I'm struggling again. Omar, I'm thinking, is this? There we go. Here we are. Thanks for sharing with us, Ant. <laughs> Thank you. you. To me, Ant, your presentation is like a bullseye of archery because I, I know how long it takes you to put that together. And, uh, and I'm, so, uh, I'm so pleased that you came tonight. Thank you for doing that. Um, and thank you for helping us learn about the technology of uh, trying to uh, get things to start. And, and you opened up early for everybody, which meant everybody <laughs> was coming early. Yeah, <laughs> so that uh, was Shame, sorry. No, you have nothing <laughs> to apologize for. Now there's a joke there that no one else knows about. <laughs> so, but thank you so much, Ant. Uh, I, I'm always, as this slide says here, I am always going to remember World Social Work Day 2019 as a, a great day um, because lots of things. We had cake, look, with the, didn't yeah. we? We had that fabulous cake yeah. um, with World Social Work Day poster on it. I was on the telly. Yeah, why? <laughs> no, you didn't get on the telly, Aunt, did you? But I got on the telly. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was poor why me why me but I got on the telly and uh, but the main reason it was a fabulous day for me was because I met you and I oh. heard that presentation and I'm so pleased that you came to share that presentation with us tonight oh, thank you thank you um so as the theme of World Social Work Day um, last year and this year, if we'd have had the chance to celebrate it, and as Ant's presentation reminds us, relationships are the most important thing in life. And relationships-based practice is probably the most important thing that we can employ in terms of being social workers when working with disabled people, when working with anybody who we work with. Relationships is the most important thing. So we started with t-shirts and I said we'd end with some t-shirts. So this is another photograph of me taken on the telly. This is just before me and Ant had something to eat at the end of the day. I was watching the news on the telly and I was taking photographs of the telly in the hotel room of myself. That looks terrible, that photo. I don't know what I was doing at the time, but that was another photo. Uh, taken during the World Social Work Day and the reason that I put that photo up there is to show you that I was there wearing my t-shirt. Now unfortunately I would have worn the t-shirt tonight but I'm not at home at the moment and the t-shirt is at home so I couldn't wear it tonight but I did get this is my photo of my t-shirt it looks really really scruffy look it's got bits of blue tack stuck on it and everything because I've been carrying it around in a bag that I take on all kinds of training days with me. That is my t-shirt, proud to be a social worker. And I am proud to be a social worker. I am proud that I have been a social worker for 30 years. And I am incredibly proud of being a social worker. And whenever I get the opportunity, I do wear that t-shirt. So I did wear that t-shirt on World Social Work Day to share my pride in social work. But I also will also always say to people, the reason I carry it around with me in a bag um, that I take on training events with me, which isn't with me at the moment because everything's being done virtually, but normally I'm carrying that round with me everywhere I go. And I'll always say to people, do you want to wear my t-shirt? So this happened one day. I do quite a lot of different creative things in the training that I'm doing. And this was a workshop with newly qualified social workers. And I asked them to create something that means social work to you. And so what we've got here is, I don't know if you can tell because my photography, my photography skills are not great, but that's a group of newly qualified workers spelling out the word hope. 
And the t-shirt we started off with was hope for all humans. And it is really important. Hope is the most important thing that we can have. And everyone is born with hope and we all need to maintain hope. And I think at the moment with everything that's going on, with the news that we've had, that we started off with from you know, the National Statistics Office, we know what's going on with the pandemic. We have to hold on to hope. And I have every hope for change in terms of the way in which we respond to disability. I think it isn't always positive. I think that um, in terms of thinking about parents with disability, in terms of thinking about the way in which we respond to disabled people isn't always positive. Um, so before I tell you about the final bit of hope and show you my final uh, PowerPoint slide, um, I think, Kat, you, um, you've been looking at the questions. Was there a question that you were wanting to ask, I think? Uh, yeah, there, somebody asked whether there was a model in between the social model and the medical model. And we've also had another one come in as well about how do we challenge discrimination against children with special needs? Okay, well, um, I think there's a whole other thing there. I think I'm going to say I will ask uh, maybe uh, Vicky and I can send out an answer in the follow-up email about maybe how we can challenge discrimination and also some of the resources that Vicky said uh, she'll be, will be sending out to you will help with the answer to that question. Um, I think that's going to take a bit more than a quick answer and we don't have a lot of time left now. So, um, but in terms of is there a model that sits between, then again, there's a complexity of answers there. In mental health, there most definitely is. Now in mental health, they're very clear about this, the social model, the medical model, and then they talk about the psychosocial model, which is actually bringing aspects of the two together into the psychosocial model. And the recovery model also in mental health is, um, is challenging um, the, uh, the medical model. Um, but in terms of disability, then, um, no, but it does take us on to our final slide, because what I would say is I don't think any of the models are great. Uh, I think the social model is the social model is fabulous. The problem is that we're not really using the social model. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is let's start to develop some new models. I have hope that this is new models. So this is and I think trying to summarize what uh, both guest speakers um, and the theory part of the presentation tonight, I suppose, is that this is about me and you. This is not about others. This is not about separateness. This is about all of us. That what we need to be doing is looking at opportunities rather than barriers and seeking out and supporting people to have opportunities, access issues, all of that, rather than placing barriers in a way. Disability is not a tragedy. Disability is not a tragedy. Really important. I could see Vicky was um, thumbs up then. I can't see everybody on screen. I've pressed a button. I don't know what's going on. I've only got Vicky <laughs> at the moment. Um, then equality in human rights is vital. You know, I think in Ant's presentation, he talked about, I think Ant's political stance is just fabulous. And he talks about the importance of equality, human rights and civil rights. And a key part of Ant's presentation, a single word that stands alone but is vital, is listen. It's got to be one of the most important things, is listening to disabled people, learning from disabled people. And I'm hoping that that's what we've uh, started to do and start a conversation tonight. And we have to challenge systems and structures. We must challenge systems. We must challenge structures. We must, as social workers, take a macro view. And that spells out the word models. You know, let's, as social workers, let's start challenging some of this old stuff. Let's, let's look at what Michael Oliver was talking about, the social model. But let's look at the way in which some aspects of the social model have been jumped on as, oh, we're doing that anyway. Let's challenge that. Let's look at challenging systems and structures. 
you know what what Vicky said informing social work England I have a disability in case you want to take that into account and then receiving back an, an email that says here or here's how to refer yourself to fitness to practice that's a dreadful system and structure within a profession that likes to you know talk of ourselves as being anti-oppressive so i have hope for the future of social work and i have hope that people have learned i've learned a great deal tonight from listening to the experience that has been shared so these um our webinars each week we try to do something around theory practice and bringing voices of experience and so just so that you know, over the next few weeks, these are the sessions we've got coming up. I think the Social Work Student Connect team are going to put into the chat box now uh, the registration link for next week's webinar in case you want to register now for next week's webinar. And next week, we're going to be going back to the basics of theory and practice. And the subtitle that we decided on um, at six o'clock tonight when we all came together is we're going to talk about having a theory picnic next week. So, um, you know, how Kelly normally starts off saying what if you had for your tea, maybe we should all have a picnic together next week because the theme of next week will be all about looking back at the basics of theory and practice because we know there's lots of new students joining us now. The week after that, we'll be looking at spirituality and social work, and then we'll be looking at anti-oppressive practice, a new model for taking action. And that follows on from our anti-racist webinar, which was very popular. And then we'll be going for the big number 20. Who would have thought all of those weeks ago when we had a bit of an idea that we shared together on Twitter that we would have come to that number of webinars and that we would have this, the kind of guest speakers that we have joining us now? who would have thought that thank you so much to everybody for tonight and um...